please help me welcome General Ben Franklin. Ooh. Thank you, General P, sir. It's great to be with you today, and thank you for your leadership, your continued leadership uh, to our nation and to these young uh, leaders here at Virginia Military Institute. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, General P, General Bartell, Mr. Shaw, members of the Marshall Foundation, distinguished guests, and most importantly, our cadets and award recipients of the General of the Army George Catlett Marshall Award. It is indeed an honor to be with you this morning and for part of the day, and I've anticipated this uh, opportunity to be with you for some time, as General Bartell would probably attest. I've called him multiple times saying, when is it? When are we going to be together? When are we going to VMI and see these great future leaders of our Army? Congratulations on your selection to participate in this great seminar, and I hope you apply yourself to the greatest extent that you can in the next several days. These are indeed exciting times for you here amongst your peers to share your ideas, and it's a time to think about beginning your career. Your college education is almost finished, and I'm sure you and your parents and those of you who have spouses are all about to rejoice. But your military education is about to begin, and I would ask you to start here today on this hallowed ground to dedicate yourself to your military education and be the best leader that you can possibly be. Give it your best when you get to basic officer leadership course B, as it's called today. Do not, as some of you will tell me when I'll see you in several months, well, sir, I just graduated from X school and I'm kind of taking it easy right now. Don't take it easy in Bullock B. Get going. And many of you have long dates until you arrive from commissioning to Bullock B. And it's a time for preparation. It is not a time off. It is indeed a time on to study our profession, to get into the field manuals, to read history, to be as physically fit as your body will allow you to be. As a drill sergeant told someone last week, and I was in presence, well, ma'am, if you don't throw up, you're not trying hard enough. He, he in front of a group, just to tell you about the sergeants you're going to lead, in front of a group of high school kids, he bet them he could do 60 push-ups in 30 seconds. And they said, no way. He, in fact, did 70. That's the sergeants that will populate the platoons you're about to take. So give it your best. You're going to lead America's treasure, our sons and daughters, and you will lead them in combat. You're joining an army for deployment, not employment. So how will you prepare for that leadership role? And I would just like to share a few ideas with you about that leadership role and a mindset that you're going to bring to military training to hone your body, your mind, and your spirit to lead and serve our soldiers and our nation. Well, no surprise, after you think about the big four, marksmanship, physical fitness, combat, life-saving, and battle drills, my ideas don't come from me. They come, in part, from two Virginians. Don't know how that works out, sir, but uh, two Virginians is where they come from. The first four ideas come from the 20th century's greatest mind, military, and state leader, General George C. Catlett Marshall, Jr. In 1920, then Major George Marshall, wrote a letter to General Mallory expressing his thoughts on the attributes of a combat leader. He said in the letter the following, assuming that you possess common sense, and ladies and gentlemen, your soldiers and non-commissioned officers pray that you have common sense, have studied your profession and are physically strong, these are General Marshall's, then Major Marshall's, four combat leader attributes. The first he said was, when conditions are difficult, the command is depressed, and everyone seems critical and pessimistic, you must be especially cheerful and optimistic. You see, optimism carries the day for our soldiers in combat. They will wonder about separation from home, possible loss of life, possible loss of a buddy, possible questions about the validity of the mission. But the optimistic leader delivers to the soldier the belief that they can and will accomplish the task at hand. It is you who must bring optimism forward and into the breasts of the soldiers that you lead. Your optimism will ensure that they accomplish the mission. For General Marshall talked about morale, and he said morale is a state of mind. It is a steadfastness, steadfastness and courage and hope. It is confidence and zeal and loyalty. 
It is elan, esprit de corps, and determination. Optimism lifts morale. Morale wins the day. His second point was that when evening comes and all are exhausted, hungry, and possibly dispirited, particularly in unfavorable weather, at the end of a march or in battle, you must put aside any thought of personal fatigue and display marked energy. In looking after the comfort of your organization, inspecting your lines, and preparing for tomorrow. It is your energy that will take away the enemy's vote. For the enemy always has a vote, and when you come back and want to rest, but instead prepare your soldiers for the fight, you will checkmate the enemy's determination. I'm reminded of a young lieutenant in the 10th Mountain Division when we were in Afghanistan. In the summer of 2006, his name was Lieutenant Darren Riley, now Captain Darren Riley. He was a mounted platoon leader in a weapons company for an infantry battalion. And they were conducting patrols up and down a river in Afghanistan all day long. Hot, tiring, um, highly charged with adrenaline because of uh, improv improvised explosive devices and complex ambushes. And Lieutenant Riley got his soldiers in a position that night, and all around him was high ground. And there were mountain spurs coming off the high ground. And he thought, in each one of these positions, the enemy could maneuver and place mortars or rocket-propelled grenades, or machine guns, and fire down on our formation. So Lieutenant Riley took his time with his field artillery observer, and they, they lazed in each one of the positions around them. And he positioned the uh, 50 caliber machine guns and the Mark 19, 240, uh, or excuse me, Mark 19, 40 millimeter grenade launchers, he placed them all in position. After midnight, they were attacked from 270 degrees simultaneously. In under five minutes, Lieutenant Riley had mortars, artillery, called for Apaches and close air support, all of them delivering devastating fires on the opponent. One soldier was wounded, Lieutenant Riley. When he repositioned a machine gunner, leaning over, giving him a sect of a fire, a rocket-propelled grenade struck behind him and wounded him in the back. He fully recovered. But his marked energy that General Marshall talks about instead of climbing into a Humvee after a long day's fight, made the difference and saved the day and defeated the enemy. Marked energy and optimism. Thirdly, General Marshall said, make a point of extreme loyalty and thought and deed to your chiefs personally. And in your efforts to carry out their plans or policies, the less you approve, the more energy you must direct to their accomplishment. You see, loyalty, ladies and gentlemen, binds an organization together. When the team believes in each other, is loyal to each other, cares about each other, that pulls the team together. General Marshall said, don't fight the problem, decide the problem. And once your commander decides the problem with loyalty, give orders in your name and pull the organization together. Lastly, General Marshall said, the more alarming and disquieting the reports received, or the conditions viewed in battle, the more determined must be your attitude. Never ask for relief of your unit and never hesitate to attack. You see, General Marshall had an offensive mind. General Marshall gave the United States Army an offensive, offensive mindset. We ought to be the army that continually takes the fight to the enemy, that has determination, that can live the soldier's creed. I will always place the mission first. I will never accept defeat. I will never quit. I will never leave a fallen comrade. That offensive spirit should beat in the breast of every leader. So turning from General Marshall's four points of optimism, energy, loyalty, and offensive spirit, I turn to a, the story in Douglas Southall Freeman, who in the 1930s went and lectured the Command and General Staff Majors about leadership, having studied the Army of Northern Virginia from the Civil War and watched the World War I Army fight. Douglas Southall Freeman, who wrote Lee's Lieutenants, A Study in Leadership, had three observations, which are carried forward today, I believe. The first is to know your stuff. That's what he said, know your stuff, in the 1930s. His example was Stonewall Jackson, who served here at Virginia Military Institute as a professor. And he said that General, Marshall, General Jackson had an uncanny ability to blend cavalry, infantry, and artillery and set him apart on the battlefield what we would call today a combined arms leader. And so as you begin this journey to serve and lead, 
Will you know your stuff? Will you take your time from graduation to arriving to read our doctrine, to read appropriate history, to reflect on your experiences in ROTC or in the Army? Some of you are former service members, as I can see by the decorations on your chest. Will you reflect on those experiences and bring those experiences forward to know your stuff? The Center for Army Lessons Leadership has a book called The First 100 Days. You can get it online. I commend it to you to read it because it's about the first 100 days in combat. And the whole idea about the book is to prevent casualties. So as you get ready to go and lead in combat, you ought to read about the first 100 days. But I would encourage you on knowing your stuff to plunge in the profession of arms. Don't hold back. Don't be timid. Plunge in. Your soldiers need the best of leadership. Secondly, Douglas Southall Freeman said, be a man. And what he meant in that period of time was to be a leader of character, to live the Army values. Easy to say, tough to live. Soldiers expect you to embody and demonstrate the Army values of loyalty, duty, respect, selfless service, honor, integrity, and personal courage. And you know that includes social media. Many of you will take off the uniform and get onto Twitter, MyFace, Facebook, YouTube accounts and act in another way. Some of you do not live the value of loyalty in blogs because you tear apart your unit, your friends, or perhaps your cadre in ROTC in these blogs. They're there. We see them every day of what happens in the social media. You are an officer 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You will be a former soldier until you die. So live our values in and out of uniform and in social media. Be the leader of character that Douglas Southall Freeman asked the leaders of the Second World War to be. Mark Twain said it is curious, curious that physical courage should be so common in the world and moral courage should be so rare. You will be expected to be both physically courageous and morally courageous, and you will find the latter the tougher of the two, but you must be morally courageous in and out of uniform. Thirdly, Douglas Southall Freeman said, take care of your soldiers. In taking care of your soldiers, the furthest thing from his mind was coddling soldiers. What was in his mind was training soldiers to standard, to ensuring that soldiers do indeed know the big four of marksmanship, first aid, battle drills, and physical fitness. Again, I'm reminded of a lieutenant in the 10th Mountain Division, Lieutenant Christine Richardson, a Transportation Corps officer, who arrived to her platoon just prior to a deployment to Afghanistan, assessed the platoon and said, what well, we must be is experts with our rifles. And the non-commissioned officer said, no, ma'am. We have to conduct maintenance on our vehicles. We have to learn to drive with trailers. We have to learn to carry loads. We have to learn to be in convoys. There's too much to do to do more marksmanship. And she said, no, from my assessment, what we need to be is experts, and that's what we're going to be. So much to her command's uh, dissatisfaction, they went to the ranges and worked as hard as they could to be experts. Fast forward six months into Afghanistan, into July of 2006 in Helmand Province, which we read about so much. There weren't 8,000 people, British, and 3,000 Marines in Helmand. When Christine Richardson was there, there were probably about 200. But leading her platoon in a convoy, they were attacked and outnumbered by the Taliban. They immediately returned fire, and one sergeant personally killed four of the enemy in his opening shots. As the convoy got through with no casualties, accomplished their mission, the sergeants came to her and said, Ma'am, what people need to be is experts with their rifle. And because she understood training your soldiers and taking care of your soldiers, it was not time off, it was time on the rifle ranges, to be experts. She got it. These seven ideas of optimism, energy, loyalty, offensive spirit, knowing our stuff, being a leader of character, and taking care of our troops are timeless principles handed down from one remarkable leader, General Marshall, and one remarkable historian, Douglas Southall Freeman. I have tried in 35 years of service to beat him. I've tried to figure other ideas. I've asked non-commissioned officers, warrant officers and officers, what do you think? Do they have it right? And indeed, they do, and they did. 
These ideas will help you to have a compass and move in the right direction in these uncertain circumstances. We live in a time of persistent conflict, of what we refer to as VUCA, a violent, unpredictable, complex, and um, ambiguous time. Violent, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous. Our enemies live in caves, but as they run out of caves, they run out of the cave with a weapon and a computer. Who'd have thought? Economies are changing, and indeed the world is changing. But your spirit will set you apart. Your leadership will make the diff biggest difference on the battlefield. Your leadership and these seven principles will see you through. General Marshall said it's not enough to fight. It's the spirit which we bring to the fight, the leadership that decides the issue. It's morale that wins the victory. It's your duty to be better tomorrow than you are today. And that's what this seminar is about, improving yourself and being better tomorrow than you are today. Your duty, keep reading, keep learning, seek out mentors, listen to your non-commissioned officers and officers, and grow in your leading experience. Our soldiers, our army, and our nation, indeed our country, is counting on your leadership today and tomorrow. In all of our formations, they eagerly await your arrival. In our active duty, National Guard, and reserve formations, they await you. I'll close with this quote, delivered by Joseph Warren in 1775 after the Boston Massacre. Our country is in danger, but not to be despaired of. Our enemies are numerous and powerful, but we have many friends determining to be free, and heaven and earth will aid our resolution on you. On you depend the fortunes of America. You are to decide the importance of the question on which rests the happiness and liberty of millions yet unborn. Act worthy of yourselves. Best of luck in your service to our country and in leading our soldiers. Participate in these coming days. Don't hide out in seminar. And may God bless you as you prepare to serve and lead. May God bless our deployed forces May God bless our Army, and may God bless the United States of America. Thank you very much. Army Strong. Ooh.